Well, here we are on Broadway.com. I'm Ian McCallum. And I'm Patrick Stewart. And I have a question for Sir Patrick from um, Amelia. When did you first meet Ian McCallum and what was your impression of him? I must have met Ian McCallum in the green room, which was served as a cafe at the Royal Shakespeare Theatre in Stratford-on-Avon when we were both in the company but not in the same place. That's correct. And I was um, far too shy to speak with him, so I guess I didn't actually meet him, but I observed him from afar and was impressed. Well, that's an exciting uh, revelation because I don't remember you looking at me in the canteen. Ah, well, I did it surreptitiously. Yes, I was probably looking at Roger Reed's or something. Yeah, like that. very likely. Mm. With good cause, With I good might cause. Say. From Alex, uh, for you, I expected you to play Hurst in No Man's Land. Ah. That's the role that I play. Was that ever under consideration, or did you always know you'd be playing Spooner? I can't really tell you, but I suspect it was decided quite early on. With consult our cons consultation, but uh, Sean Mathias would have, would have his views on that. Um, it just seems to be right. I mean, I, I can't imagine anybody now playing uh, Hurst other than you. Uh, and I think I could have had a crack at it, but yes, that's all. I couldn't have done it. I couldn't have done it. I think well that it. could be said of both of us. We could have had a crack at the other yeah. role. But I think I'm going to, in this moment, modestly take credit for you playing Spooner because when we shared a dressing room for 22 weeks, I, as I got to know you so well, I s knew that you were the actor who was born to play the part of Spooner. So when we talked about the play, for me, there was never, ever because a Because I'm a creep. <laughs> no, because you're witty and oh. urbane and you're fabulous with language and, and you have a twinkle about you. All of these things are present in Spooner. Well, this is from Aaron. Good. What do you have to say to people who think they're coming to see Jean-Luc Picard and Gandalf when, when they come to see No Man's Land and Waiting for Goddard? In the early days of my being on Broadway, which was when I was doing my one-man show, the Christmas Carol show, um, there were audience members who would show up in costume, that is, wearing Star Trek uniforms. And were disappointed that you weren't? I think there was a little disappointment that they were not seeing something more Star Trek related. Mm. Instead, mm. they were getting Charles Dickens. But I made such a fuss <laughs> about that that the costumes have disappeared. You haven't seen one since we've been at the Cork Theatre. No, have you? that's no. true. Um, I, I, frankly, I don't care why they come. If they want to come and see Gandalf or Charles Xavier or Captain Picard, that's fine, or Magneto. Yeah. Let's just get them in the seats and then leave it up to <laughs> us to entertain them, which I think we do yeah. reasonably well in our two shows. And, and I would say that uh, Star Trek and uh, Tolkien are not your run-of-the-mill uh, popular entertainment. They're, they invite an audience to, to think and be intrigued mm -hmm. uh, and, and to be happy to be excited and entertained at that level. Mm -hmm. uh, and those are the sort of people who like going to the theatre, I find. Mm -hmm. uh, and and it, because they haven't been to the theatre before, it uh, uh, doesn't mean to say they're not going to enjoy it. And uh, I agree with you. I've got another question for you. This is from Sarah. Yes. Is it common for people to tell you they don't understand these two plays, Waiting for Gardo and No Man's Land? And what do you say should that come up? Mm. I say I have a lot of sympathy because when I first came across uh, Waiting for Goddard, when it was first done in England, uh, and also No Man's Land, I didn't think much of either play, although I enjoyed the performance. Uh, and I wasn't, I wasn't uh, intrigued enough to, to go and see either the, the, the plays again in, in other versions. Uh, and how foolish I was, because now we worked on them, I, I say to folks. Um, I don't find anything difficult about these plays. I know exactly what they're about, and I can tell you if, if you want. Uh, and uh, I think sometimes think there should be a disclaimer in the playbill or, or, or outside the theatre saying these plays are not to be uh, understood. They're, they are not carrying a message. 
Uh, if you don't know what's going on, that doesn't mean to say uh, the play hasn't been working. Uh, it has, uh, if, if you understand that these are real people in situations for them which are very real, but which they don't necessarily explain much about to the audience. You are uh, an observer, and uh, it seems, being, I don't want to be over modest, that the audience find these plays very, very funny. Now I tell you, no one can find something funny if they don't know what's going on. You have to be able to understand. And the same with being moved by the plays, and they're, and, and they're moving too. But um, they're not fantasies. Uh, it's not all happening inside uh, someone's head. Uh, all the characters aren't the same character. They're, they're, they are relatively real people, and they have real problems. Uh, some of them can't remember very clearly, and some of them drink too much, and. Um, some of them keep falling over, and some of them have bad feet. One's got prostate problems. <laughs> you know what's difficult about this? That's life. Yes, uh, just recall that. Remember that it's life, and it's not about existentialism, no, or the meaning of life, or does God exist? No. no. Um, you have a question for me? Well, it's in what ways, says Laura, are, are, are you, are we envious of each other? And, and uh, go on. Uh, well, I saw the question. I was looking over your shoulder, so oh, to speak. So, uh, so I, I, I already had a prepared answer. Tell me. Um, uh, two ways. I Ian knows, and he thinks I'm foolish to feel this way, but I envy your, uh, your university oh, yeah. education. Of course you do. Um, Ian went to Cambridge, and I, my formal schooling ended when I was 15. I envy that. But I also envy your head of hair, if only because in the two plays you don't wear a wig and yet you manage to make your hairstyle look completely different, just uh, with the aid of a little tail comb and uh, a bit of a uh, blower. I envy that, whereas yeah. I have to stick on a wig for oh, one yeah, of those. But you look gorgeous in it. Thank and you. without it. Uh, Thank you. What do I envy? I'm not very good at envy, actually. I, if someone's got good qualities and you have many, I'm very glad for them. <laughs> I don't think, oh, they'd be better if they gave what those qualities to me. Um, well, I do envy you being married to uh, Sonny Ozell. Well, that was, if you were going to run out of something to say, I was going to suggest that as a possibility. Mm. From Oscar, what was it like returning to playing Gandalf so many years later. What does that mean? Well, I suppose there were 13 years between the beginning of the shoot for Lord of the Rings and the beginning of the shoot for the, the Hobbit trilogy. However, in the intervening years, the plays had been coming out piecemeal. Uh, I was signing my image of, as Gandalf on a number of occasions and uh, I was waiting to hear whether The Hobbit was going to be made, so it was always a part of my life. Mm -hmm. Getting back into character, I'm afraid, was no more difficult than I mean, the beard applied and the moustache and the eyebrows and the false nose and the wig and the, the pointy hat. And, you know, there he you is. Are. There he is. I can see him. Oh, Does it look a bit like that when I do it? Uh, <laughs> yes. No, you, no, as you were doing it, you became him. That was the Gandalf face, which I only know from Gandalf, not from you. Eddie wants to know, what was the most difficult thing about being an actor in the Star Trek universe? Did your Shakespearean training help you? Absolutely, Eric. Eric it is? Eddie. Eddie. Absolutely, Eddie, it helped me. Um, uh, in that Star Trek dialogue is somewhat heightened dialogue. I can always recognize it just by hearing it. It sounds like Star Trek. And we know that Shakespeare's dialogue and language was heightened. Some of it was worse, some not. But there's another very good reason. There are no pockets in Star Trek uniforms. There are no pockets in Elizabethan tights, or so far as we know, hose of any kind. Oh. And so, as Captain Picard, I was the one member of the cast and crew who knew what to do with his hands, which, of course, Excellent. is nothing. Excellent answer. After doing the play this many times, do you think Godot actually exists? Well, yes, he certainly exists. He's a farmer. He has goats and sheep, and he doesn't treat his employees very well. They have to sleep in the hayloft, and uh, they get beaten, at least one of them does. And he doesn't keep his appointments. 
He's a thoroughly unreliable person. And Beckett doesn't want you to be interested in him whatsoever. But he exists. And one day, one day, I have a feeling that answer is going to follow you for the rest of your life. No, it was an excellent answer. I, I, I agree with every word you said, but I think people say, Ian McAllen said that first. Well, and very think, nice to meet you. And, and you too. I've you. enjoyed this a lot. Good luck with everything. Good luck but, tonight uh, in your performance in Lemon's Land. Right? Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to it. And I'm you sure too with too. all your future endeavors. Thank you very much.